All right, we're going to start looking at um, chapter 2. Okay, and chapter 2 is going to focus on um, polynomials. Okay, so we'll talk about um, quadratics, okay, how we solve them. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about some inequalities, okay, which is, you know, when you have your less than, greater than signs, we'll get into some of those problems. Um, and we'll, sometimes we'll use algebra to solve these kinds of things, sometimes we'll use the calculator. Okay, so it'll be a, a mix of different kinds of strategies. Okay, so I just want to graph that and try to understand the behavior of it. Okay, 2x cubed minus 3x <coughs> squared minus 3x <coughs> plus you, plus 2. Okay, so let's, um, let's take a look at it. All right, so we've got 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 3x plus 2. Okay, and the question, once I graph it, I want to answer is how many times does it cross the x-axis? Okay, just looking at the picture, um, how many times does that cross the axis? Luke? Three times. Yep, it crosses three times. Okay, and when we, I might have mentioned this, but when you look at the exponents okay, in this problem, that gives you a hint at how many times it could cross the x-axis, which also gives you a hint at how many times the graph could turn. Okay, so how many times does it cross the x-axis? Three times. What's the y-coordinate? Everywhere that it crosses the x-axis. So if you were to find this coordinate, what would the y-value be here, here, or there? Ian? Zero. Zero. Okay, anytime you're crossing the x-axis, that's where your y-value is zero. Okay, so a lot of times what we're going to do when we want to find where a graph crosses the x-axis is we're going to set y equal to 0. And once you set y equal to 0, that'll tell you where the graph crosses the x-axis. Okay, how could I show that this is exactly the same as that? Okay, they, they are the same. But how could I show it? So there's one way I can do something that would suggest they might be the same, but then there's another way I can actually do it out and prove they're the same. Luke? This, well, yes, this is the factored form of what's above. So you reverse, you reverse factoring. So we reverse the factoring. Yeah, we distribute it out. Okay? If we multiply all this out and we get what's up above, that proves they're the same. Anybody think of a, another way, a visual way, it doesn't prove it, but it could suggest they might be the same. Yep? Graph. You could graph them. Okay, if you graph what's on the bottom and you graph what's on the top and they look like they're tracing right over each other, that suggests they could be the same. But the only way to really prove they're the same is with algebra, and I'm going to foil this out right now. Well, that would only tell me that they're the same at that one spot. Uh, okay. All right, so if I had, let's say I had a graph like this. Yeah, so where x is 1. And you're saying you get the same point on both. Yeah. So there's two different graphs that if you happen to pick that one point, they'll come out the same. Yeah. And, and maybe even they come out the same at, you know, a, another point and another point. But we can't check every single point. Okay, but that's, that's a good thought. Okay, but let me, um, let me do this out, and let's, let's see that we do get the same thing. Um, so I get 2x squared, take away x plus 2x. Okay, when I take away x and then plus 2, that gives me plus 1x. And 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. Okay, now I've got to distribute uh, one more time. Okay, Curtis, what's um, x times 2x cubed? 2x. Uh, I'm sorry. 
What's x times 2x squared? 2x cubed. 2x cubed. All right, let's try another one. Let's see if I can not give you the answer. What's x times x? x squared. x squared. Okay, and then x times negative 1 is negative x. And now distribute the negative 2. Minus 4x squared minus 2x plus 2. Okay, let's combine like terms and see what we get. Okay, 2x cubed. Um, what's x squared minus 4x squared? So yeah, minus 4x squared, but then plus an x squared. Oh, uh, minus 3x. Minus 3x squared. Yep. Uh, negative x take away 2x. Minus 3x. Yeah, that gives me a minus 3x. And the only thing I have left is a plus 2. Is that what we had up above? 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 3x plus 2. So they are the same. I just proved it. All right. So now let's, um, let's go through and find where it actually crosses the x-axis. Okay, the calculator can help us with that. So you turn it on. Go second, calc, 0. And 0 is going to tell me where it crosses the x-axis. Pick a point somewhere to the left. Pick a point somewhere to the right. It's going to look in between those dotted lines. And now take a guess. X is negative 1. Okay, that's one answer. Uh, the other answer, you'd have to do second calc 0 each time. Um, but I can tell you it's going to come out to 1 half and um, 2. Okay, those are going to be your other two answers. Okay, so I can use the calculator and do second calc root, but does anybody know how I can look at the factored form and tell what the answers are? Because that's actually how I got these other two. I just looked at what I had there and got the answers. Second part equals zero. Yeah. Okay. If you can factor something and you want to know where it equals zero, if you can factor it, it's super easy. If you can't factor it, it's hard. Okay, just set each factor equal to 0. Solve that. Solve that. And solve that. And you'll get the three answers we had up above. Negative 1, 1 half, and 2. Okay, without factoring it and just looking at, looking at this, uh, kind of hard to figure out the three answers. Okay, so eventually as, um, as we kind of go on in this section, we'll learn how do you factor something that has three sets of parentheses. Okay, we'll, we'll learn how to do it. It, it. it turns out you can only do it if your numbers come out nice. Okay, if, if the numbers are really hard, like decimals to work with, um, factoring is not going to help us too much. Okay, so any questions on, on that idea? Okay, notice how many answers we get, three answers. Notice what was the highest exponent in that problem. Three, okay? So this, as we go on, we'll learn this number tells us a lot of things, okay? One of which is the maximum number of answers you can get. All right, so if you have a number, okay, in, in the last problem we had three numbers, but if you can find a number that is a solution to this equation. It's a number that you plug in for x and you get 0 for y. That point, comma 0, is called the x-intercept. Okay, so in the last problem, negative 1, comma 0 was an x-intercept, 1 half, comma 0, and 2, comma 0. Okay, another name for an x-intercept is also called a root or a zero of the equation. So if you see directions that say find the roots of the following, it means find the x-intercept. Okay, or it means find the zeros. All 
different ways to say the same thing. All right, so now let's think about something a little simpler than the last problem. Let's just think about a line. Okay, other than a horizontal line, how many times can a line cross the x-axis? Just once. Okay, it can't curve back and do it again. It can only cross one time. And if you wanted to get x by itself in this equation, that would tell you where it crosses. What would be the two steps to get x by itself here? Yeah. Subtract b and divide by a. Yeah, subtract the b and then divide by a. So if you have a linear equation, that's super fast. You don't need to factor it. You just subtract the b and divide by a. Okay, so if I wanted to know where the line y equals 2x plus 3 crosses the y-axis, set it equal to 0, set y to 0, solve for x. What's, um, what x, what's the x going to be here? Yeah, John? Yeah. Subtract the 3. Divide by 2. Okay, so lines are the, the simplest kind of equations to find roots for. There's only one answer, as long as it's not horizontal. Um, if it's horizontal, it's possible there's no answer. Or infinite answers if it's right on the x-axis. Okay, but in general, you'll deal with something like that. Okay, any questions on that one? All right, so one step up from a quadratic, I'm sorry, one step up from linear is a quadratic. And how many times can a quadratic cross the x-axis? Could cross up to two. What's another case? It could cross just once, come down, touch it, and go back. And what else? Zero. Okay, so how many zeros? Could be 0, 1, or 2. And remember, at the end of yesterday's lesson, we talked about the discriminant. And the discriminant tells you how many roots you could have. Okay? If the discriminant comes out negative, no, no roots, no x-intercepts. If the discriminant comes out um, positive, you get two roots. If it comes out to 0, you get one root. All right, so let's, um, let's go through and try to solve this quadratic. And it says approximately, so when we're done, that means we can round our answers off to, to decimals. Okay, if they don't tell me where to round, I generally round to two decimal places. Okay, what's my um, first step to solve a quadratic? I gotta get it equal to what number? Yep, I'm going to get it equal to 0. So what I'm going to do here is I like the x squared term to be positive, especially if I'm going to try to factor. I'm going to bring the 2x to the other side and subtract the 1. All right, so I was just explaining how we move everything from the right side to the left so we get it equal to 0. Um, and I'm looking at that quickly. I don't think this is going to factor. So if you can't factor it, What's another way to solve a quadratic besides? You can use the quadratic formula. Okay. Um, in this case, Bree, what's, what's A? Two. Two. And Hannah, what's B? Two. Two. And C is negative one. Okay, so we'll plug everything into the formula and see what we get. Um, Connor, can you remind me how the um, quadratic formula starts off? Okay, that part, the 4ac, that's going to come up a little later. First part is negative b. So negative b plus or minus square root. Remember what comes under the root? 
Luke, can you help him out? Uh, B squared minus 4AC. Minus 4AC. All divided by 2A, which in this case is 4. four. All right, so right away I'm noticing I'm minusing a minus. Okay, so that becomes a plus. 4 times 2 is 8. 8 times positive 1 is 8. <coughs> What's 8 plus 4? 12. 12. Great, and now if they wanted an exact answer, I would reduce the square root of 12 as 2 square roots of 3. Okay, but since they said just find a decimal, well, they said round it off, approximate. I'm going to find the decimal right now. So just type in okay, negative 2 plus the square root of 12. And then divide that answer by 4. Okay, so we get 0.366. What's that? Significant, significant figures? Yeah. Nah, that's okay. <laughs> just round to 3. Uh, where did we get the 4 on the bottom? The four, that's the 2a in the quadratic formula. So take a and double it. Okay, and then our other answer. Okay, what I can do is just press second enter a couple times, and then I don't have to retype in the whole thing. I'm going to home sick right now. Okay, so all right, so negative 2 uh, minus the square root of 12, and then divide that by 4. Okay, negative 1.366. And there's, there's our two answers. Okay. Questions on finding the roots of a quadratic. Okay, you can always find roots of a quadratic because you have the quadratic formula. Okay, so this, um, you can always resort to that if we have to. Um, you could just put a comma, and I'll know you mean it's this answer or this answer. Okay. You didn't put parentheses around it, so I know it's not a coordinate, it's not an interval. It's just this number, comma, this number. Okay. Yep, if you want to write or, you can write that too. Okay. This number or this number. That's fine. All right, so this part, don't write this part down. Okay, this is the old way that in order to find a root um, graphically, they, you used to have to take, take your cursor, okay, put it near a root, uh, press zoom, two, and then zoom in. And you had to keep zooming in till you could see it clearer and clearer. Well, now we don't have to do that zooming in anymore. Okay? We have a button that can calculate the root for us without worrying about any of that zooming. So that's a much better method for finding roots. Just use second, calc, and then zero. If you've got a newer calculator, it will say zero. If you're using an older calculator, um, the older ones actually did say root under the calculate menu. Um, probably not this one. No, that one still says zero. But if I go back, um, go back to like a TI-82, these are really old. Second calc, notice the second option is root. Okay, so if you had a calculator, maybe a Casio, if they called it something different, you saw root. Root means the same thing as zero. Okay. Can you also trace the line? Uh, did that like type in x equals zero? Like, do you trace it? Um, well. Yeah, you have to set how far it goes for every. Yeah, the problem is if you type in when x is zero, which I can do, it tells me the y-intercept. I want to do it the other way. I'd like to be able to type in when y is 0, but you can't. Okay? You can only type in values for x. But that's where the calculate feature comes in. So. Okay. Any, so any questions on how to use the calculator to find a root? All right, so let's try it on this one. Okay, that's not an equation we could solve with quadratic formula because it's not a quadratic, it's a cubic. So let's just type it in exactly the way it is. I'm going to type x cubed plus 2x. And I, I want to, you know what, let's get it equal to 0. 
So what would I have to do to each side to make that happen? Subtract one. Subtract one. Okay, type that in. X cubed plus 2x minus 1. Okay, I'll do zoom 6 just to make sure I have a standard window. Now before I even look at it, I know it's a cubic. Okay, cubics can cross the x-axis up to three times. Doesn't mean they have to cross three times. It might only cross um, once. Might only cross twice, but it could cross all three times. Okay, this one looks like it only is going to cross once. Okay, so second calc zero. Pick a point to the left, to the right, and do a guess. Okay, so we get a root at about 0.453. Okay, now, another way we could have done this, if you don't want to rearrange it and get it equal to zero, leave it just like it is originally. Okay. Put x cubed plus 2x in y1. Put the other side in y2. And now I'm not going to look for a root. I'm going to look for where y1 and y2 equal each other. What does that mean visually, where, they, where these equal each other. Yep. Where they cross each other? Right. If it's not equal to zero, now I can look for where they cross. Does anybody remember what that's called on the calculate menu? Yep, that's an intersect. Okay, so go to your fifth option and calculate where these two things cross. And if you do it that way, you get exactly the same answer. So when you're trying to solve a root, or when you're trying to solve an equation for its roots, you can do a zero if you get the equation equal to zero, or you can do an intersect if you put something in y1, something in y2, and see where they cross. I don't care which way you do it. This graph only has one. Okay. It could have had up to three, but this time it didn't. Okay, so just kind of a little bit more information about third degree polynomials in general. They have the form ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d, where a, B, C, and D can be any numbers you want, except A can't be zero. What would happen if you make A zero? Then it turns into a quadratic. You just wiped out the cubic term. Okay, so don't, don't let A be zero. But B could be zero, C could be zero, and D could be zero. If you did that, that's the simplest cubic you can have, Y equals X cubed. Okay, page 80 shows some different kinds of cubics, but that's pretty much the general behavior. Okay, sometimes you get a cubic that actually does the two twists and turns that it's allowed to. Sometimes you get a cubic that kind of thinks about starting to make a turn, but never really does. Okay. The ones on the left, that's kind of like our last one. Kind of started thinking about turning, but it never really did. Okay, so one thing we have to be careful about when they ask us to find out how many solutions there are to this equation is make sure there's nothing off the screen you can't see. Because if there is a solution off the screen and you miss it, uh, then you're wrong. Okay? So this equation is a cubic. And... How many times did we say earlier a cubic could cross the x-axis? Up to three. It could turn twice to make that happen. So I'm going to graph this. And I'm going to see what it looks like. 
Okay, it is possible it goes off the screen, so I might have to adjust my, my window a little bit. All right, so we have x cubed minus 5x squared plus 6x uh, minus 1. Okay, I'll do zoom 6, and let's see what we got. Hey, I would say that, that window is fine. I know this kind of graph could have up to three answers. I can see all three. There's nothing else that's going to happen off the screen. This part's just going to go down forever. That part's just going to keep going up. So the question here was not to find um, what the answers were. It just said how many. Three. Now the next question is to find one of those three. They want to know the one that's in the middle. Okay, so Jacob, can you walk me through these steps to find that middle root? When using the calculator? Yeah. Yep. What do I how do I do that? Remember the menu we have to go to? Same place we did the uh, intersect. Trace. Okay, uh, so one thing you gotta press before you press trace. Because if I just press trace, it's just gonna go like that. It didn't give me that menu for intersect. You wanna help him out? How do we, Ethan? Yeah, second calc, and now I'm going to find a root. Okay. Um, can you tell me, what do I do from here, Ethan? Yeah. Uh, Anybody help him out, John? Uh, just hit enter to the left of the middle one. Yep, hit enter somewhere to the left. And I'm going to the right of it. Okay. enter. Yes, so like in between those two and then enter. Perfect. Okay. So it says the answer is about 1.55. Okay, if we round it up. Okay. Any questions on um, doing that? Okay, if you do have calculator questions, make sure you ask me um, before the test tomorrow. Okay, so part, part of the test is knowing how to use the calculator to, um, to do stuff. I, I won't help you with calculator stuff tomorrow, uh, but I will help you today, okay, if you have any questions. All right. Um, so the last thing we're going to look at, we've, we've already done a little bit with it. It's just zooming, okay, how, how you adjust your window to make sure you see everything that's on the screen. Okay, and this part isn't very long. Okay, so we'll just do these couple slides and then um, and that'll be it. Okay, so anytime that we uh, have to solve a problem, okay, we usually use one of two approaches. Okay, either we're going to try an algebraic approach, okay, like when we did quadratic formula, or we might try representing something as a graph and using the calculator. Okay, that's more of a graphical approach combined with technology. So those are usually one of the two approaches we use. Okay, so we're going to um, try to use a graphical approach to solve this next problem. But before you can use a graph, you've got to create an equation to plug into the calculator. So we're still going to have to create the equation ourselves, but then we'll try to use the calculator to help us out. All right, so this problem is going to be about investing um, money. Okay, and the, this individual has $20,000 to invest, and they're going to invest it in two different types of accounts. One of the accounts is going to pay 6.75% interest, the other account is 8.6. Okay, 
Now, Bill wants to make as much money as he can, so you might say, well, why doesn't he just invest all the money where he's going to make more interest? Well, maybe this could be the kind of account where there's risk. So maybe you could have the possibility of making more money, but you also have the chance of losing money. All right, so he's going to split his investment up. And the type of account Bill's investing in is called a simple interest account. Okay, this is not the way banks calculate interest. They use what's called a compound interest formula. But that's a little more advanced, so I'm sticking with the simple formula. Okay, and the formula is I equals PRT. So I is the interest that you make in the account. P is called the principal. Principal is how much money you put in. How much did you invest? Okay, R is the rate you invested at, but make sure we always write the rate as a decimal, not a percent. And T is how many years you leave the money in the account for. Okay, so T is your time. So I want to find an equation that represents how much interest we'll earn, Bill will earn, in one year. So basically, he's going to earn interest from two different accounts. And what are we going to do with the interest from each account to find the total interest? We're going to add them together. So we'll find out how much interest he earns in the first account, how much he earns in the second account, and then add them up. Now, the one thing they didn't tell us is how much money he's investing in each account. So that's my variable. Okay, let's assume that he invests X dollars at six and three quarters percent. Okay, and that's all they're going to tell us. Okay, he invests X of his dollars at six and three quarter percent. Okay, so let's find the interest he makes in the first account. So I need the principal, the rate, and the time. How much money is Bill investing at six and three quarter percent? X. X. That's my principal. What's the rate? But make sure we do it like that. Luke? 6.75%. It is 6.75%, but we just have to convert percent to decimal. Yep, 0 0.0675. So you just move that decimal two places to the left. And the last thing I need is time. Okay, What's the time frame we're looking at in this problem? One year. One year. Okay. So the interest he's going to make, I'm just going to write this how we normally do. Put the number in front of the x. That's how much interest Bill makes in that account. Okay, hey, next account. Interest at 8.6. Okay, principal. Well, X is how much he's investing in the other account. So how much money does he have left for this account? Why? Well, we could pick another letter or what's the total amount of money he has? 20,000. How much did he already invest? X. X. So what's left? 20,000 minus the X. That's how much money is left. Okay, 8.6%, um, how do we write that as a decimal? 0 0.086. And again, the time in this problem is just one year, so that's not having any effect on anything. Okay, what property do I need to use here to simplify that? Yeah, we're going to use distributive. So we've got... 20,000 times 0 0.086, that's 1720. Yeah. So 1720. And then times or minus 0 0.086x. Okay. That's how much interest he's going to earn in the other account. Now to find the total, what do we do with box one and box two? Add them up. And that'll give me a formula for my interest as a function of x, where x is how much money was invested in the first account. All right, so we've got 0 0.06, 7 
25x plus 1720, uh, actually minus 0 086x. Okay, anything I can do there to maybe clean that up or combine things a little bit? Ian? Combine the x's. Yeah, let's just combine the x's. So 0 0.0675 take away 0 0.086. Negative 0 0.0185. Plus 1720. There's a formula that will tell you the total interest he'll earn, assuming he invests x dollars in the first account. Is that a negative? That is a negative, yep. Yeah, I'm just going to double check I did my arithmetic right there. That is correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just couldn't see it. Negative All right. So we have our equation for the total interest. And now when we look at this equation, if you just look at the equation and forget about the word problem, you could plug in any value for x you want. Right? You could take and multiply any value by negative 0 0.0185 and then add 1720. But when we think about the graph in terms of our actual problem, what kind of values for x do not make sense? Negative. Negative. You can't invest negative money. How about a maximum value for x? Yeah, we're limited by how much money he has. He only has 20,000. So it doesn't make sense to look at what happens if he invests 30000 He doesn't have 30000 Okay, So that's the difference between just looking at an equation in terms of just pure algebra or putting it in the context of a word problem. Okay, You have more restrictions when it's a word problem. All right. So I want to know how much did Bill invest at each rate, assuming that he earned this much interest. Okay, let me get the equation back up there. Where in that equation is the 1509 going to get plugged in? Great. Um, not for the x. Yep. Yeah, for this is like your y value. This is i of x. Okay, that's the interest that's earned. So you're going to plug in how much interest he earned for i of x, and then we're going to solve for x. Okay, so we've got 15, 09, 10 equals negative 0 0.0185x. Plus 17, 20. And hopefully x doesn't come out negative, because if it does, I have a problem. Okay, he should not be investing negative money. Okay, um, step one, I'm going to get that 1720 on the other side. Okay, um, how do I do that? Yep, I'm going to subtract it. Minus 1720. Negative 210.9. And my last step, I got to get that negative 0 0.0185 out of there. Okay, how do I do that? Ian? You divide. Divide. So divide by 0 0.0185, and that's a negative. So I get So that's what X is, but what, what was X again? That was how much money invested in which account? The first one, the 6.75. Okay, how do I figure out how much he invested in the other account? He invested 11,004 in one account, then he invested the rest uh, in the other. Okay, so the amount of money at 8.6% is that 8,600? 
That's what it comes out to. That's not not right. No. Oh, okay. Okay. So any um, any questions on that? Now you could have used a calculator too. You could have put this in y one, put this in y two, and see where they cross. Okay. This time I just thought the algebra was easy enough. It was faster to do it that way. Um, yeah, you might be able to use one of these other, other equations to do it. I think the fastest way is just 20,000 minus what you said the first time. I think that's the fastest way. Yeah. All right, um, this one. All right, let's come up with the formula for this since there is a rectangle problem on the, on the test. I think we've, we've already looked at these kinds of problems before. It says, consider all rectangles that have a perimeter of 100. Find a formula for the area in terms of the width. So they're telling me what they want me to use as a variable. Represent width. Okay. Um, what's a good letter for width? W. w. Now, since it's a rectangle, I have two sides that are the same length, two pairs of two sides that are the same length. So if the perimeter is 100, and I use W here, and I used up W here, what's left for the top and the bottom? Think of that as like fencing. If you only have 100 feet of fence and you use W on the left and W on the right. What do you have left? Yeah, you have this amount of fencing left. But you have to split that fencing up equally between how many sides? You have two more sides if you're going to make a rectangle. So. What would be my length if I simplify that? So 100, what's 100 divided by 2? Um, uh, 50. 50. 50 minus w. Yeah. OK, so if you had 100 feet of fencing and you use up w on the left and on the right, that leaves 100 minus 2w feet of fence, but take half of it because you've got to put half on the top and half on the bottom. Okay, and if you add up all four sides there, they will add up to 100. Now the problem wants to know a formula for area. Okay, what's the formula for area of a rectangle? Length times width. Okay, my length is 50 minus w. My width is w. So now you tell me the width of the rectangle. I could plug it in right here, and I could find its area. Like if you said the width is 10, I would say the area is 50 minus 10 is 40. 40 times 10, 400. Okay, it gives me a quick formula to find the area. Assuming the perimeter is 100. That's, that's all that this formula works for. Okay, questions on that? Okay, so we're not going to do example four, but if you were to graph it, what kind of values of W would not make sense? Definitely can't use negatives. And W can't be bigger than what? Um, w can be bigger than 25. Can't go bigger than 50. Can go up to, but not including 50. Otherwise, you would have negative length or something. All right, so I'm going to talk um, a little bit about part one of the test just to go over a couple things you'll, you'll need to know because you're doing that by yourself for homework. Um, that will be due at the beginning of class tomorrow. Okay, so you'll come in. I'll collect that. 
Um, if anybody has any other questions on the stuff that we did today, um, we will probably have a, about five minutes or so. You could ask me a couple quick questions, and then you'll do part two. Okay, since we only have 39 minutes, we won't have time to do like a 30-minute review in class. Okay, so I will be here after school if you do need extra help.